Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Link Live Facebook stream. I'm Marina Mayer, Editor in Chief of Food Logistics and Supply and Demand Chain Executive. And I'm here with my crew. I always have to think of something new every week and I forget. So, <laughs> <laughs> Brielle, we'll start with you for introductions. Hi, I'm Brielle Jekyll, and I'm the Associate Editor here. Hi, I'm McKenna Morales, and I am the Web Editor. And today we are talking about sourcing and uh, sourcing from overseas, sourcing from other parts of the nation amid COVID and how this is impacting a lot of the businesses um, because sourcing impacts a lot of different parts of the supply chain, whether you're importing, exporting, um, or just sharing resources with, with neighboring um, companies. So, um, you know, we have some statistics and stuff from our website um, on our supply and demand chain uh, website, sccexec.com. Um, a study from FM Global says three in four CEOs and CFOs are not fully prepared for an adverse financial impact of the changing climate as a result of sourcing from overseas. Mm -hmm. Because when COVID happened, people kind of said, nope, we don't want any of your, any of your product coming in. Um, and eight in 10 of those CEOs and CFOs believe that they don't have control over the impact. So, you know, we're talking about asset, asset tracking and reverse logistics. So Brielle, I know you kind of had some insight on that um, aspect of it, if you kind of want to step in and, and share your well, Insight. I can give you, so I, um, on our, on sdcexec.com, you can find all of our 20 year anniversary stuff. Uh, and my most recent article um, is about how e-commerce has impacted the last 20 years of the supply chain since SDC first launched. Um, and this is actually a common topic in our household after, after e eats e-commerce kind of took off, people wanted to scale so fast and be able to get their, it, it, it switched to smaller packages at a faster rate instead of larger shipments at a slower rate. So that kind of forced people to look for sourcing overseas and look for like the cheapest way uh, to be able to sustain their business in a fast, um, fast manner. So that kind of, yeah, that, that pushed everything overseas. And I think that um, COVID really, showcased how how that can be a problem and how maybe we need to reshore some of these operations and some of this sourcing um, and especially on top of that so since um, people since we've become so overseas everyone is 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 looking for more transparency in their products and you know sustainability and uh, social um, uh, good, good social practices are important to consumers nowadays because things have become so offshore and so far removed. There's so many steps in between you and your product where, you know, 50 years ago, that wasn't the case. You knew where your products were coming from. And so it's kind of shifted a little bit, uh, not a little bit, a lot of it. Uh, consumers want to know where their products come from. So that kind of goes into the reshoring situation too. Um, and visibility and tracking. I mean, there's so many technologies out there that can help keep track of where your product comes from all the way down to sourcing. Uh, and so, yeah, everyone wants to know where every part of their material comes from. I know um, in past when I, when I was focused on the luxury sector, Tiffany switched to, to make sure that they were showing where all their diamonds were coming from. So you know that they're not a part of the blood diamond industry. So that's important. Ralph Lauren does that too. They've recently started adding a QR code on their mm -hmm. tables so that people can scan and track the entire supply chain. And I think it's really important that luxury fashion designers are doing that because there is so much like rumors about slave labor being involved in the fashion supply chain. Mm -hmm. so being able to see that all the way through and make sure that everything's sustainably sourced and ethically sourced is gonna not only like create that loyal customer base, but it, it's also gonna like give you a better brand reputation too. Right, so luxury consumers are kind of really looking for sustainable options and 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 businesses that practice, you know, good, have good social practices. So, mm -hmm. and they're kind of leading the way. So, because you can afford, you can afford to spend that extra, um, you know, 
however much it is to make sure that you're buying from a company who's sourcing their material from a positive place or a eco-friendly friendly place. Um, and then from there, it trickles down. So fast, fast fashion, unfortunately, is kind of where the issue really lies. Um, you know, the, um, the cheaper clothings of the world, they're, they're sourcing from, you know, very far away and you kind of lack that visibility. Um, so that's where it, it's kind of trickling down and people are becoming more interested in that in the, in the lower end as well. Yeah, and as people move towards ethical brands, the fast fashion brands, they have that excess inventory too. And for example, a few mm-hmm. years ago, with all these reports about the store H&M, they had so much inventory that they resulted in burning the excess. And I can think of better uses than doing that, but it just wouldn't sell. They were out of style. They were out of season. They just couldn't sell them. That actually is a very common practice in luxury brands and high, high end fashion because they don't want their products being resold on uh, the gray market because they want to keep that. Um, they, they, they very much care about their image. They want to remain a luxury brand and they don't want their, to see their products um, on the lower end. So they will burn excess inventory. Um, but once that became known after the whole H and M thing and, and, it, and, I think, I forget which company, but it became very um, apparent throughout social media and everyone knew about it and, and companies reacted to that. So um, a lot of them had to switch and stop um, that, stop that practice and announce that they were stopping that practice and showing exactly what they were doing with their excess inventory following that to make sure um, that they weren't just, you know, releasing a press release say, hey, we're not doing this anymore. Right. So they are dealing with their excess inventory in a much better way. And hopefully that will happen throughout the entire industry. And that's interesting to- because there's a lot of today's consumers are more about, you know, the sustainability side of things. Mm-hmm. So when companies are, you know, taking those and supporting a good cause, whether it's donating to schools or homeless shelters, whatever the case is with these clothes, I get that that's at the target market, but, you know, they may be, have better, you know, brand appeal after that. Mm-hmm. Well, Amy is doing that. They have all those commercials on Hulu right yeah. now. They're donating like $30 million worth of merchandise. Yeah. And a lot of it is the excessive, excessive, excess um, inventory because, you know, a lot of those companies source from overseas. And when COVID happened, everything either stopped or it took a lot longer for it to go through the process of customs and to come overseas and come through the States because of all these additional regulations that the ports were putting into place. And so, you know, that part is interesting because then all these companies were stuck with it, you know, and they don't know what to do with it. Um, So that goes back to, you know, all the asset tracking. I know uh, Juniper Research did a study and basically saying how asset tracking was growing like enormous amounts, like double digits amounts for that reason. Um, So it's just kind of interesting to to hear that in luxury. And it's also like that in food because we talked about last week, the traceability, was it last week? Week before they all kind of blend together, but about the sourcing of meat, how they now have the labels on there that shows you where it comes from, you know, what cow it came from, what farm it came from. And that's huge, especially now because a lot of these farmers, you know, who may have had to rely on getting product from overseas are now, you know, even these food processors are having to rely on more local options that may not be the most price efficient, but um, you know, that's what's available. Yeah. And on top of the ethical brand, um, most consumers today are now really focused on wellness and you want to keep, you want to know where your, where your food comes from. So that is, it's absolutely happening in food. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's just crazy how far even the food chain has, has expanded. I mean, there's plenty of stuff that we, that we get from very far away. Um, so it's interesting to see if, how, how that will happen. I thought something that was interesting about COVID was for the clothing, like people bought significantly less clothes while we were all in lockdown. However, shares in Lululemon, I believe, or not shares, but like, um, the- I know who you're talking about, like the workout, any of the workout yeah, clothes. The- sure. Lululemon's like price or like inventory went up or sales yeah. went up. 
I'll get there eventually. <laughs> the sales went up because people were finding more loungewear. Right. Well, mm-hmm. it's like with Walmart, they had this whole thing that I think it was even in a commercial where they talked about how they were selling their shirts it's like skyrocketed, but they weren't selling pants. It's like mm-hmm. because people were just putting the, the shirts on <laughs> for the Zoom meetings, but not really caring about what they wore on their pants. And I just, you don't think of those things. And then you're like, oh yeah, we kind of do the same thing too, you know? So I have sweatpants shorts on right now. <laughs> I, I have workout shorts on and we can see, but you know, <laughs> it's just funny to me that like, that's how it's completely changed. And now there's still companies that are saying, my employees are working from home the, the remainder of the year. So, you know, this isn't going to change anytime soon. Um, and that's, it's just, it's just funny to me how, you know, the fashion industry has kind of taken hold of, of all of this. And, and, you know, I haven't, the only time I buy clothes is when my kids are outgrowing their clothes, but I mean, they're not in school, they're not in camp. So I'm not buying, you know, the water shoes or all the pairs of shorts, you know, they walk around in their pajamas all day. So you know, it's just, it's a different way of shopping too. Mm-hmm. Our food bill has gone up. Yeah. <laughs> Mine <course>. too. <laughs> I mean, but you're, not, but you're not eating out. No, we're not eating out. So I'm making, you know, five lunches for my son, yeah. but <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's just a different, a different way of, of shopping. Um, but the inventory management, you know, and, and I know, you know, Brielle and I kind of talk on this in our upcoming transportation chain episode that'll be coming out in mid-July, but we do talk about technology and fleet and transportation. And and there are technologies out there that are designed for inventory management. So companies can kind of better manage and Mm -hmm. forecast what's ahead. So they're not stuck with excess inventory. They're not out money. Um, You know, they're not, you know, shipments of stuff aren't stuck on a truck somewhere and isn't getting to where it needs to go. Um, so the technology side of that is really stepped up to kind of help these companies kind of better control these problems, whether it's a pandemic or not. Yeah. I think it's interesting because like I said, e-commerce has kind of, kind of pushed the offshoring and, and, and sourcing in a different way, but now there's technologies where you were on the inside. That's so much easier to be able to handle this. Um, and then this week, so I always take, we always take a, a, for our 20 year anniversary, we take an old article from the first issue and I, we kind of look at that segment again and restructure it, um, you know, and, and show what's changed in the last 20 years. And so this week we'll have an article about um, sourcing and uh, e-procurement. And it's, it's, it's interesting to see how much it's changed in the last 20 years and how much, how many tools there are now that you can use to help um, you know, find the best partner for you and make sure, and it, and it goes, it's, it's from everything from finding the best partner, finding the best product, finding the best price point, uh, on that end of it. And then also, like you said, the, in, the technologies that control inventory to know exactly what you need. And then also the data solutions that can, and machine learning that can predict what you will actually need. That's so interesting. <laughs> that is so cool because I worked in retail, a lot growing up and so we always had to plan like your day and if you wanted to make a certain amount of money by the end of the day and you had to sell a certain amount and you had to have inventory in stock and like the most popular items so I so planning for that inventory is gonna revolutionize (laughs) yeah so it's completely changed now it's no yeah it, it's like that's really what data is for and machine learning that's really where it's going to go and it's not gonna it's not gonna just predict inventory it predicts the pain points um, in your operations it will predict you know where where you should probably get the sources from like all that it, it can predict anything it, it's really very sophisticated that's so we topic. see, oh, I'm sorry. You can go. Oh, no, you can go ahead. I was get, actually going to just change the top. Oh, I was just going to say, it'd be kind of interesting if a lot of these grocery retailers were able to kind of implement something like that, because I think that that would kind of help reduce a lot of waste. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I don't know how easy that would be to, you know, it's hard to tell when consumers are buying stuff, but I mean, you know, this panic buying and then everybody was out of stuff. I mean, that machine learning would have come in handy, like here, hit pand- pandemic mode. Here's what you need to survive, get people fed, keep people coming in the door so they're not scrambling for toilet paper or frozen pizza. 
So I think, and, and just excessive waste, I mean, in, in general, mm-hmm. because I mean, you, you walk in, you don't want to stuff a whole thing of bananas, it's going to go to waste, um, especially when it comes to the food side of it. So I think that would be kind of interesting if a lot of these groceries can kind of tack into that and, and get yeah. that on board. There's actually a lot, there's software providers that are kind of pivoting towards that. And they're kind of like um, mar- marketing that way. Like, hey, we want to reduce food waste, use our solutions to better predict what your consumers will need. Um, but, you know, obviously like machine learning is still growing. So it will probably be even more sophisticated and it could maybe prevent something like this from happening again. Um, you know, the, the food shortages that happened during the pandemic. But, in, but I think that the pandemic was so unprecedented and yeah. hasn't, that it really threw everyone for a loop. Yeah. And, and there's studies on our website that show that companies are still not even prepared if a second wave ends up coming. Exactly. Like, and that's, you know, I don't know how companies can be prepared. I mean, I'm not in the day-to-day trenches like, like our readers are, but um, it, that just is mind boggling to me because I feel like from our vantage point, writing about it, and covering and interviewing these people, I feel like, wow, they've they've moved mountains to make things work. And then they're coming forward and saying, no, we're not prepared. Yeah. <laughs> so that's just mind boggling to me how they how they think that that's really the case um, when I feel like they're doing a stand-up job. <laughs> I know there is a current study on food logistics right now. Sorry, I'm trying to, I'm sitting where to block out the sun. You're fine. There's a current study on food logistics that says that most consumers are able to find their products in the grocery stores now, while like, I think 30% said that there's still certain items that they can't find, like Clorox wipes or disinfectant wipes, like that yeah. kind of stuff they cannot find, which is fair because my local grocery store still does not have those things. We haven't had hand sanitizer. I mean, we're down to like the littlest. And the paper towels, we had to buy the actual like commercial paper towels that are used in like mm-hmm. restaurants and stuff. Cause that was every, the only thing we could find. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's, and it's a lot of it falls back on the manufacturers too. They just, they weren't prepared either and can only, you know, produce so much at a time. And then if you have to add in all these social distancing guidelines and all these other contactless stuff, it kind of throws a big wrench into they're getting hit from all sides. So yeah. it's just, you know, it's crazy to me. Um, and then, um, yeah, so, so Brielle brought up the 20 years. So that, that's good for people to know if you log on to stcexec.com, we have a 20 year anniversary special, um, special coverage. And she's been doing a good job every week of producing, um, you know, a look back, I guess you could say of, of how technology has changed over the past 20 years in supply chain. It's, it's really interesting. McKenna's also, also been doing a pros to know where they now um, every week, which is really cool to read too, because they they also, th- these pros to know that are previous winners, you know, we're, we're kind of re-interviewing them to find out, you know, what has changed in 20 years on their side of things. And that's important to understand from the professional development side, because we still have to train all these people to make sure that, you know, they understand inventory management and mm-hmm. um, this week waste reduction. For, this week for our pros to know, we have people from the healthcare supply chain that were talking with us. And it, they were like, the last three months have been the most hectic it has ever been. And just I seeing can't even imagine. three months compared to like 20 years is insane. Cause I mean, we always say that like anything can happen in a year, but really we have learned that anything can happen in weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And that is interesting because when we talk about sourcing, I think we all kind of forget about the pharma side of, of things. You know, we instantly think of retail and food, you know, pharmaceuticals, they have their own pain points to deal with when it comes to sourcing, especially if they are getting medications from different parts of the world and, and manufacturing plants, you know, whether they're headquartered here, they may be making them overseas for whatever reason. So, you know, we kind of forget that side of things and that's interesting to, to keep in mind. Um, so yeah, so for all of our readers, um, also, uh, next week we kick off on June 30th, our supply chain network summit. I'm so excited. So be sure to go online and check it out and register. It's an all day series of events on supply chain threats. That's this month's, um, theme. And we're talking about supply chain threats in grocery, in retail, um, 
you know, what happens when companies return back to work, how to kind of prepare your, your warehouse, um, and some great industry experts um, from Coresight Research, from Zebra, from BSI, and from Airrate. So very, very excited to make sure you log on and register. Um, and, and be sure to keep an eye on our podcast channel link um, because Brielle, she kind of touched on this podcast that she's having later today um, about sourcing, which will be online. I don't know, I have to look at our schedule. A couple months, maybe a couple weeks, I mean. So, oh, yeah. so um, keep an eye on that. Yeah, don't forget to subscribe, L-I-N-K, your uh, link to the global supply chain. Perfect. And as always, we are looking for some um, guest experts on some of these um, really button down topics that we know about, but we would prefer to have an expert join us on the panel um, discussion. So if you are interested in joining us in our crazy group on a Facebook Live going forward, please reach out because um, we'd love to have you. And we also welcome feedback and ideas and suggestions and the friendly hellos that we get after we go live. I always love those. Um, so yeah, so make sure you log on to foodlogistics.com, sdcexec.com. Did I still say that right? Or did I mess that up? We'll get there. SDC. You'll find us. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a tongue twister. You say it. Um, and we thank you very much for listening to today's program. Thank you everyone for your help. Thanks. Bye.